All right. Hello to everyone in our audience. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties we're having so far. Uh, my name is Duncan Dykes. Welcome to Doc Edge 2022. We have here today as our guests Austin and Will from Long Live My Happy Head. They are the co-directors of the film. Um, so great to have you guys with us. I know you've gotten to say hi to the audience a little bit already. Uh, yeah, we weren't sure if we were saying <laughs> hi to anyone, but yeah, we're, we're happy to be here. We're very happy to be here. Yeah. I'm Will, this is Austin, right. just so, to give that he's already done a very good introduction to who we are. But we're in our office, this is the Melt the Fly headquarters in Edinburgh. So just to do a little rundown, um, I'm going to start us off with a couple of questions, um, and then partway through we'll go to questions from our audience. So if you're watching from our virtual hub, feel free to put some questions into the chat, and then we can bring those up on screen later. Uh, so first question I have for you guys. Um, how did you first encounter this story? Uh, and what made you think this should really be a film? You want to take it? Uh, sure. Um, so our kind of uh, breakthrough documentary, if you like, was called Synchro Skim, and it was about the World Stone Skimming Championships. Um, this is a bit of a tangent, but we were basically looking for an artist for that film. We went to the Edinburgh Comic Arts Fair, um, and there was basically a bright like a fluorescent pink garden shed that Gordon had painted himself and it was the first day he'd launched his book um bittersweet which is the comic book that we took most of our animations from this one, one. Yeah. Yeah. um sunny. and we basically just he was quite shy at the time so we ended up buying the book and reading it before we really spoke to him but the way he had kind of structured the comic book was very much uh of a documentary format it was him exploring these ideas of his mortality and his relationships um, so we, then we basically said, do you want to come to the pub? We'll talk about the idea of a film. And he was, uh, I think all three of us were very naive about it. So we all just said, yes, let's do it. And then, so the, the initial film was about um, comic books and art. And there's a space you see in the, obviously a graphic medicine conference that features in the film. And we were basically making a graphic medicine film. And then we met the, um, the force of nature that is Sean Puller, his boyfriend, and that obviously changed our narrative, and, and we had to adapt to that as we went along. Mm, thank you for that. I was going to ask, actually, so with any documentary, working with the subject is always going to be a sort of sensitive dynamic, because these are often people that aren't used to being on camera. You talk about, um, uh, sorry, you talk about him being uh, shy to begin with. Can you talk about how you guys worked out that relationship and how comfortable they were being on camera through these very sort of sensitive times. Yeah, I think um, it's true. It's, it's one of the most, uh, I guess, like under, under kind of valued or it's not spoken about so much. It's just like the level of commitment that you actually have to have in making a documentary to just a relationship like that relationship that you have with the contributors in your film and it diff for different kinds of films is a varying kind of degree of intensity but with something like this especially when we were forced to kind of support each other and be um so close during the pandemic it was really important that we were respecting each other and kind of like being honest with each other in order to kind of allow for that comfortable that, that comfort on camera to, to exist because I think initially the shyness was maybe a little bit Gordon was comfortable because it was focusing on his work but then when we started getting a little bit more personal about him and his relationship with Sean and um, there was definitely yeah there was give and take in terms of you know they didn't let us come along immediately to all kinds of things it was a bit of test the water here and you'd kind of have to ask and see if they were okay with stuff and um, there's a lot of negotiation that comes with sort of weighing, wading, wading into someone's relationship that, uh, yeah, we had to kind of be quite sensitive about, but I think that was, that was it. It was kind of built on being open with each other, being honest about concerns, and then also just kind of knowing when you're like pushing the buttons too hard or like when you're kind of, you know, when you are tipping it, tipping the kind of balance a little bit, because there was a lot of, um, sometimes a lot of weight placed on shoots because things like we would isolate because of the COVID pandemic, we would, and Gordon's vulnerability and stuff like that, uh, we would isolate. So there was a, there was a period of time where we spent two weeks sleeping in here in our office so that we could film with Gordon and Sean before they went, before Sean flew away. And it's the scene in the film where, um, 
Gordon and Sean finally sit down and Gordon interviews him for his Carers comic. That's the, we were sleeping in here for like two weeks and then we had to go and do that. And you kind of realize there's a lot, lot, a lot more pressure placed on the situation. So you kind of had to um, bear that in mind and try not to, there was like another occasion where I think we had to sort of say, look, relax, we don't need to get it. We've got other stuff and you kind of just said, don't push too hard at points. And then there's other times where you kind of have to say, we really need this. And then there's a conversation that happens. Hmm. But I think just to say, like, I'm grateful for <laughs> for Gordon and Sean's uh, openness and like allowing us to to witness such a difficult time in their lives and for being so uh, so kind to us and and kind of and kind to the to the audience and kind of being so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. for them. Uh, and you talk about uh, the impact of of COVID on the shoot and how that that changed the dynamic of of kind of in, being part of these people's lives as you film them. Uh, can you talk about maybe at what point in the shoot COVID came in? How much how much it affected everything? Uh, yeah, I think we've had kind of the luxury of the last couple of months of not thinking about these things, but they were very present. Uh, so just going back. Um, yeah, it kind of came at a, a really awful time for Gordon in particular, as you see in the film. When And I think that's one main takeaway that I think people get from the film is that uh, for a lot of people in the UK, I don't know about New Zealand, but the pandemic was kind of uh, easy. You know, they got to work from home or not work at all and get furlough. And I think the importance of us isolating and taking it seriously was for people like Gordon. And I think this film really shows that because it was really like dire circumstances being stuck in your house with um, a terminal illness basically um but yeah it came right in terms of production it came right as we were just at the end of our development funding and pitching for more funding basically so we did a lot of our um pitches for the film uh online and that was around the time where you see like the 40th birthday in the film where um that was quite an interesting shoot for us because we were obviously all just adapting day by day and doing one thing after another. Um, but I was basically sat there with three screens, probably what your vision mix is doing right now, but cutting between like different party members in the Zoom. And then Austin was outside Gordon's window. Luckily, he's got a ground floor flat on a, a scaffolding tower that you'd built. It was just a ladder that time. A ladder. <laughs> it was too early in the pandemic. Yeah, but wrapped with like black wrap to stop the reflection of the uh, of the window obviously and that whole scene was shot like they basically threw uh gordon's window into his, his living room and um and the crew in the states so that was like the final part yeah. that was like a last minute amazing uh pip and stefan and rodrigo like kind of went out to to sean's from washington so it was about a five and a half hour drive and they stayed there for two days like very last minute where i'm like so, totally kind of um we owe a lot to them for for their commitment at that time because yeah. it was very difficult a lot of people weren't working so yeah, yeah. but I, I guess the final thing to say is relating to the previous question about gordon and his shyness is but that was the moment when we bought him the gopro and then all that video diary stuff starts coming in and i think uh, there's an element of that where he started owning the content and taking agency of what he was what he was telling us and um that was really interesting because we didn't know any of that had happened we would just get these memory cards back with like three hours of footage on and have to go through them and, and see what like Gordon had been up to for the last two weeks. And um, some of it was quite funny and some of it was like, mm. you know, really tragic and, and serious, but um, it was testament to Gordon that those are the things that he, he decided he wanted to film it and, and for people to see basically. It sounds like a really fascinating working dynamic to have the the crew split up so much like that and have some stuff just be entirely from from uh, Gordon. I was going to ask in terms of that that American crew filming those scenes with uh, Sean over in America. Um, one of the most I think really emotional scenes of the movie is uh, one of those last kind of uh, asides to the camera that Sean does, where he he sort of has a, a, an emotional moment talking about the experience of being separated from Gordon because of the pandemic. Um, with a scene like that, obviously it's an incredibly uh, sensitive thing to try and ask from, from a non-actor. Um, was that something that the, the crew on the ground had to just get comfortable enough with Sean to do? Or were you guys 
able to call in and talk to him through that as well? No, we were very much, uh, we handed a lot of, we, we would talk to the crew about what we were looking to get. And I think a big part of it was talking, we wanted to talk about what it was like when Gordon was there, like trying to talk about what, 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 what Gordon was like when he was visiting the one time that he did go. And I think it also, uh, and the, and Pip was the, the sort of producer director who kind of took over for those scenes. And we weren't in constant communication, but it was more of a kind of report back kind of thing. But she just, she had a great um, instinct for it and she knew kind of what we were looking at. We'd shared some of the scenes that we'd cut and the teaser that we had up to that point. So they had a bit of a feel for what we'd been doing and then um, but yeah, they they very much kind of had to had to get that sort of stuff out of Sean themselves. But I think it came at a time when Sean had been isolated a lot, and there's not at that point there was nobody on site with him. Like he lives on site in a house there, and there was barely anyone, if anyone, still on site with him. So he was alone in this kind of big space. Um, so I think he felt like. Uh, I don't know. I think he kind of felt ready to talk about it sometimes because he'd been quite alone with his with his thoughts. And we had a lot of conversations with him on Zoom where it would be kind of similar stuff. Like he didn't have a lot of places where he could go and like talk to someone who could understand it uh, in the same way as we could, I guess, because we were quite close to Gordon's side of the story as well. We were very aware of what was happening for both of them at all times. In a way, it was it was we were kind of right in the middle. Um, so. I think he was kind of ready to to talk a little bit at that point. Yeah, mm. I mean, just retrospectively now, it's just such a relief that we're not in that place anymore. And that, um, yeah, everything kind of worked out. Yeah. 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 Well, we're, we're talking about the some of the kind of heavy emotional content in the film. Can you guys talk a little bit about what you felt were some of your biggest responsibilities in making this film? to the subject matter, to the, the people themselves? Uh, yeah, I suppose that, that's a good point to point out before we answer that is that we'd normally like really bumbling and crying in the first two questions of these Q and A's, but you're lucky that we actually haven't just finished watching the film this time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we very much decided from the beginning that we wanted to make a film that Gordon was gonna see and benefit from and that was like a massive motivational driving force for us mm. um i don't know it was it was a learning curve the whole on the whole way through i think we had to we got two really good execs on board basically who, who could almost act as emotional coaches as well as a uh, story consultants but they had had an experience with similar films so amy hardy did a film called seven songs for a long life which is about hospice care and Jeffrey Smith had done his Emmy award-winning film, The English Surgeon, which is of, about brain surgery in the Ukraine. And I think um, it was, yeah, we had to surround ourselves with these people be because we were doing our best basically, but it was really, as you say, a lot of um, just really intimate and high tension emotions we were dealing with. And um, it was just a lot of communication all the way through. I don't think there's any, of a secret to it than that but yeah. yeah in terms of responsibilities i think um we always felt uh, <clears throat> a big the big responsibility to gordon but there's also like a feel like a, a lot of responsibility towards sean because um as you kind of see as gordon's exploring in the film as well the experience of carers and the people that are really putting a lot into changing their lives like completely completely changing their lives i think sean describes it as like building up to that kind of inevitable crescendo of where it's going to dominate your life, like looking after your, your loved one. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of responsibility in, in the, in the making of the film, but also in the kind of how you continue to handle the film afterwards. Like, I think we're really proud of the fact that Gordon and Sean have been able to see the film and have some really like wonderful experiences of speaking to people who have also now connected with their story. And I think in terms of responsibilities, it's that that was a big one, like just just to, to the contributor. And then, yeah, I mean, Gordon's uh, his focus became the carers, right? He started writing that comic book about the carers. So we definitely wanted that to be a, like a narrative thread. And I think uh, a really good kind of uh, follow up from that is we created 
four uh, individual videos that are extended carers interviews from that we shot during the film and they've been put on uh, the open universities website which is um like a virtually attended university here in the uk so uh, a lot of the work that was done for the film has now been incorporated into a, an educational curriculum and that's basically all the content that Gordon was researching for his comic book about carers. So I think for him, that's a really good thing to have out there in the world and, and mm. accessible. Mm. Well, thank you for that. I have one last question before we go to questions from the audience. Uh, we're talking about kind of the various ideas the film picks up, the, uh, the idea of focusing on the carers and people like that. If there's one thought or idea that you would want an audience to come away with after watching the movie, what would that be for you guys? Hmm. Remember your impact points. Do I remember my impact <laughs> points? Not really. Well, I think I would say, yeah. Um, in making the film, I, I got a much more of an appreciation of the kind of unique, uh, the 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 uniqueness of each individual person's experience of cancer or come of, or facing like a kind of a terminal diagnosis, uh, and that you should be very. It's, it's more about. Uh, listening and being compassionate and understanding what that what is best for that person because I think a lot of the time people are like you can beat this and you can you can kind of fight this but there's a lot to be said for the for just like supporting someone and and being there for what their needs are I think Gordon Gordon's uh, way of processing what what's happening to him is admirable in that it doesn't it's it's it comes with a level of acceptance and understanding and then communicating that to others and then thinking about you know he's kind of outwardly expressing kind of his concerns for other people i think there's and that's obviously important to him and and rather than being like you can beat it you can beat it it's like um it's it's good to kind of understand what's going on for individuals and then try and support them in in their own individual way because i don't think there's like a catch-all kind of um means of tackling these kinds of uh issues when they come up for people yeah, it's the, it's the bit in the film where like Adam Bessie, the other guy with the brain tumor, says he was reading Lance Armstrong's book and it was about outmanning cancer and that didn't work for him. And I think we took that to heart. We, we focused a lot on the language. We didn't really use words like beating it or remaining strong. It was more of just, as Austin says, finding your own way to deal with it and then having the support around you um, that just does it in the way you want to do it rather than saying, you know, just buck up and yeah. and, and force your way through it. Yeah, because I think yeah. it, it allows, it, it creates a space for like humour and understanding. You know, it's like Gordon wants to talk about it. Other people don't necessarily want to talk about it all the time, but like Gordon wanted to talk about it and that created a like a space where people he loves can can like almost like move on from it and, and enjoy life. And I think that's Gordon's big... Uh, Gordon, one of the most impressive and amazing things about Gordon's attitude is that he has been able to, he's been able to create that uh, situation for himself and for the people that he cares about where they're it's not the be all and end all it's like there's still a lot of life uh, to be had and enjoyed mm. well thank you guys so much for that uh, we're gonna go to some questions from our audience now uh, from Laura uh, what was it like working with animation was this something you guys had experience with before uh zero experience and it was very very difficult that was good though. <laughs> it was good um, it's a good question yeah we were uh really lucky to have uh, ross hogg as like the animation art director he is a, a bit of a staple animation person in in edinburgh um so he was able to figure out workflows that um just really stays true and authentic to gordon's comics so we actually got entire pages printed of all the different risograph colors that are the same pages, like the same texture and the same ink as in the comic. And that's all we used in the animation to give it an authentic feel. But I think uh, directing wise, it was really confusing because we were basically typing out all of our directions and saying, no, you've, you've done this eyebrow wrong. You've done this finger wrong. And eventually we just realized the best way to do it was Austin to stand up in the office and me to film him on my phone and actually just play out the action. <laughs> Um, so then you've got the duration of how long it needs to be and also the little nuances and movement and things like that. Um, but it was also a feedback 
loop where we had Gordon included because we didn't want to create anything that like wasn't true to his work. And I think six out of the eight are directly taken from his comic, Bittersweet. And then there's two that we originated, and that's the MRI Techno one, uh -huh. which was an absolute nightmare because he has like a full 360 degree <laughs> spin, which I think <laughs> man, did not enjoy doing that. <laughs> and the the title sequence, which we basically asked Gordon for his direction, how should we open the film? And he wanted a big Lebowski tribute. And we tried our best and it just didn't work because we were basically showing the opening to the big Lebowski for a completely different film. But <laughs> you will notice that Gordon is wearing a tool belt and that is the only remaining like Easter egg wink to the big Lebowski uh, in the opening animation. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a good, it was, it was also quite interesting figuring out how to translate Gordon's comic book panels and how he's telling his story in the comic book medium into animation for the screen. Cause we decided early on that we wanted to, we didn't want to like emulate the panels. We wanted to translate them to like cinematic language rather than, um, rather than just like animate the panels in the same way and move between them. We wanted to transition as if it was an animation. So that's why we were kind of zooming out, we're punching into stuff like the heart. And then um, this is a good example of like when Gordon pulls his glasses up in one of the animations and he sees himself and his dad in place of the people in the hospital. That's like a really beautiful panel in his comments where you're looking through his glasses, but but we kind of were able to incorporate it into like a, like a scene. Yeah, you put like focus <clears throat> pulls in the animation yeah. stuff, that stuff that, uh, it's a bit, comic book terminology is you have the gutters between the panels and that's kind of where your mind interprets the story. Whereas animation, we have to figure out what goes in the gutters basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. So it was a really interesting process and like Gordon definitely, uh was reluctant at first because we were <laughs> editing his work but then he kind of saw it as part of the narrative and how it was fitting into the story in the film and uh, and then he was on side which was important <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for the question laura all right well to our next question we have uh what well, looks like matthias uh what should you do to try and modulate the tone mixing the drama and the comedy because it's it's obviously quite emotional in places but you still keep it quite light in other places yeah, I think it was always like we were always very aware of it as a as something that we would we would be balancing. So um, and we knew I think a lot of the documentaries we've done as well, it's important for us to have like those elements of comedy that kind of help to connect you uh, to the characters. I mean, there's a lot. I think you feel the drama and the, and the sadness because you've already connected with the sort of humor and the lightness, the, the kind of light side of Gordon's character. So, yeah. It was tricky to balance, but I think it's important to show um, when you are dealing with a film so so heavy that that's yeah. not what it's like for the person all the time. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't hard to capture the content of the humour because that's how Gordon and Sean are. They're like, I would say Gordon is maybe they've got uh, Sean is a bit too cutthroat with his humour sometimes that we maybe didn't put those clips in because they might not translate. They might just look like it's being a bit mean but it, I think they've built a relationship where they can just be really honest and, and have quite very dark humor um so there was like a lot to choose from but I mean ultimately I think it probably comes down a lot to Barbara Tonish and our editor as well mm. um she just got the the whole concept of the film immediately really connected with Gordon I think um, she had a lot of her own life experiences that basically related to what was happening in, in the film. So she was a very good barometer for striking that tone and balance. And I think, I don't know, I, I really like the fact that people say uh, it's got a good balance because when we watch the film, you really are in quite a dark place for a long, long time. And I think that's when the jokes really punch through because you're kind of desperate for them at some point. And it's just like, yeah. A, a huge relief but yeah i mean it's all gordon's personality we met him last like a couple of days ago and it, yeah it makes you laugh far. every time he was amazing and yeah. he also revealed to us that he had uh, <laughs> he has he's been working on a, a draft comic about the basically about the residual trauma that exists from being filmed <laughs> and what it's like to live like <laughs> without a documentary crew form, form it, following you all the time it's like it's basically based on like a spoof version of uh, Alfred Hitchcock's like psycho in the shower moment where Gordon's having a shower. 
Yeah, I hope it comes out one day because yeah. it looks funny. It looks really funny. So he's he's just he's a funny guy, and he's like, yeah. So you can't. I don't know. Yeah, I can't. think he thought that was the last frontier that us filming him in the shower. He's maybe just fearing that <laughs> we were going to ask for it at some point. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for that. Uh, our next question we have from uh, from Flo. Um, was this film like anything you'd made previously? No. Not, <laughs> not at all. Yeah. Uh, we made a film about the World Stone Skimming Championships. I guess it does have similarities to a film we were making at the same time, which is uh, called Harmonic Spectrum. And it's about piano player um, with autism and he uses the piano as a, a navigation tool, basically a communication tool. Um, and the connection there is that it's basically someone with, uh, you know, a mental or physical disability or illness who's using art to cope with it. Um, so that's the kind of the framework we were always thinking of is, is creating these metaphors through art about how someone is, is dealing with whatever adversity they have at the time. But that was a 17 minute short um, with, I'd say, I don't know, much less existential pressure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've never done anything like it. That's no, a short answer. No, yeah. I mean, this was for us like yeah, our first feature film. So, as Will was saying, like, not that there's any less commitment necessarily to the co contributors or the story in a short film, um, not in the way that we seem to do things anyway. But uh, <clears throat> it was a different, it was a, it was a very unique experience in that, um, first of all, we hadn't really dealt with such a heavy topic and then we hadn't had to deal with uh, contributors for so long and in such um, an intense way at times. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was a very, yeah, it, was, it was nothing like our previous films. Yeah, I think ultimately we're so incredibly proud of it and it's really nice to have a relationship with Gordon and Sean now where they still want to hang out with us as, as friends. But I think uh, we haven't committed ourselves to another feature because it, it is so, so much commitment from yourself, just mm. in every sense of the word, like financially, emotionally, and yeah. So no, we haven't made anything mm. like this. <laughs> Great, so to go to our next question, we have from Callum. Um, how is Gordon doing now? Uh, what does he think of the film? He is, so yeah, like we were saying, we met him for a coffee on Wednesday and he had created that draft of the comic. He's also <laughs> been, uh, it's Carers It's carers Week in the UK here. So um, it's like a week of raising awareness about carers and he's kind of re-sketching and re-kind of um, redressing them. Because the, the carers comics that he put up in that exhibition were kind of sketches. He was in a difficult place during the pandemic and he wanted to, he was encouraged by Adam Bessie, who's that comic book artist he meets at the, near the beginning in Brighton, um, to just just do it, like just get some stuff out. So they were kind of initial rough sketches, although they're very good. And uh, so he's been working on that stuff and touching touching it up. Um, him and Sean, so Sean was here up until, so Gordon turned 42 on the 20th, 20th of May. <laughs> Uh, and we were at his birthday party, which was great. It was a real surprise birthday party in a bar uh, round the corner yeah. from, from his house, which is also around the corner from here. Um, and he was doing really well. Two cheesecakes, yeah. lots of happy faces. Well, he walked up to the, the door of this bar we were in and he saw a sign on the door saying, private function, uh, seven o'clock. So he, he walked away basically because he thought he couldn't go in because it was private function. <laughs> realizing it was a surprise birthday so <laughs> yeah but yeah but he's, he's he is doing doing really well uh he faced a couple of difficult like difficult months and there's still uncertainty around the tumor he he underwent that surgery that you see in the end of the film and then uh, that you hear about at the end of the film and then yeah. after that he had radiotherapy in january which was designed to shrink shrink the or just stop the growth of the original tumor um and it did affect him. It affected his ability to like find words, and some of his kind of his, he, he gets fatigued quite a lot easier these days. But he's 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 learning to manage it. And uh, and Sean was here for for a long time, as I was saying, and he's coming back again on Sunday. Yeah. And then they're going on a tour of some venues in the south of England uh, with the Garth Newell Music uh, Chamber Music Band. So mm -hmm. Gordon's going along to that, um, which will be. Quite nice. 
but yeah, he's doing remarkably well. well. Yeah. yeah. That's really wonderful to hear. Um, and especially wonderful to hear that you managed to have a, a proper in-person surprise party as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, for our next question, we have from uh, Stephanie. Uh, was it challenging filming during the lockdown? Um, you've talked a little bit about this, but I guess, do you want to talk any more about the uh, how that workload worked in terms of who was filming Gordon and uh, what your responsibilities were mainly during that time? Uh, yeah, what can we say that we didn't say previously? I think it, it certainly was challenging. I think, as Austin said, we we spent like, we did an isolation each. I isolated a week before Christmas to film with him on Christmas Day. You isolated in the middle of summer, which wasn't very nice, no. to film uh, Sean getting back from the States, that amazing hug in the flat. That, that's, that was that one. And then we did the isolation together for the final scene. But yeah. um, I think it just went on for a really long time as well. So we, we obviously found ways around it for filming. But, I mean, most of the time Gordon was filming himself. Some of the times we were shooting through the window, uh, which is why you get a lot of contrast between handheld stuff and, and just statics. Mm. Uh, but even like in post-production, it was still, COVID was still very present. So we had to um, deliver like a voiceover booth into Gordon's bedroom and run an XLR cable out into Austin's camper van where we were <laughs> listening outside and uh, directing the voiceover like that way. Um, what, what other challenges were there? I think? Yeah. I don't know. It was it was it was weird. It was kind of just the, the sort of atmosphere of COVID for us was like it was strange because for a lot of people it quietened down, but we all of a sudden had this like increased uh, importance of like everything we were getting and and sudden uh, sudden kind of it was all very urgent. It was like Gordon's birthday is coming and Sean's coming over and we have to isolate and all this stuff and, yeah. and we were also pitching a lot online as we were saying so it was it was a kind of period of time where all of our other work and things fell away and then we had to, we had quite a lot of opportunity to focus on this story and focus on this film so it was it was challenging but it was also quite uh kind of focusing yeah I think it, it might mm. not be that strange for you guys in New Zealand because you seem to cope with the pandemic very sensibly but I think for us we we genuinely had to take it really really seriously because it wasn't just about spreading the virus to our friends or whatever it was like no you could really compromise someone so it was just um yeah with that question about responsibility that was one of our major responsibilities was trying to keep Gordon healthy yeah. and, um, and, and we didn't give him COVID, yeah <laughs> which is good I imagine that would have made for a, a very different movie. Um, we're running a little bit short on time. I'll try and get through these next questions as quick as I can. Uh, from Jordan, uh, with the moment that was animated of Gordon taking off his glasses and showing his eyes, uh, that really stuck with Jordan. Was this a meaningful or intentional moment uh, from Gordon? Yeah, it, it is a, it's a big moment for him, actually. So like he says at the beginning of the film, I'm really glad, yeah, that you kind of, that it, that it resonated with you because it is a big thing. Like you hear him say, why don't I draw my eyes so that I can still keep a bit of privacy. Yeah. But in, in, in the actual comic book, he does the same thing. Oh, that's not good. There you go. He takes them off and says thank you at the end. So it, it is... It is like for him that was that was him sort of saying you know I'm I'm being vulnerable for, for you and and that was what he was doing in his comics so we did want to convey that in the film and it was a big uh, it was a big thing for us throughout making the film is that we always wanted it to feel like Gordon was telling you his story uh, and us and that was one of those important um, kind of tools that he was using that we felt that very much had to, had to kind of be in the film so you could like. It's also he sees it as being um, he sees it as being like an intentional and meaningful thing, so it was it was it was only kind of yeah. God, Gordon has this thing where he says sometimes he's uh, projecting onto Comic Gordon. So Comic Gordon has the brain tumor, and Comic Gordon's going through all this horrible stuff as a way of removing it from himself. And it, and the glasses are another layer of uh, protection, basically, of not being vulnerable. And that's exactly why he put it at the end of his book to say thank you because you know that is a, a moment of uh connecting with you directly and yeah. uh we basically copied gordon's amazing storytelling and put it in the film yeah 
<laughs> Perfect. I'll jump to our next question from John Reynolds. Uh, who were the camera people? Those guys. Yeah. And then Stefan. Stefan and Gordon. And Gordon and then Sean filming himself singing. Oh yeah. In Goth, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was us two for everything shot in Scotland and uh in, yeah. For the American stuff, that was uh Stefan Wiesen, who is a German cinematographer based in Washington. Yeah. But I guess that yeah, that's kind of about our relationship in a way is that we've been friends for like twelve years and um people ask who's the DOP, who's the direction stuff, but we quite literally, if our shoulder gets tired, we just hand the camera over and <laughs> just do that mm. all day basically so yeah fantastic so our next question from john again uh, where can it be viewed in scotland uh his brothers and sister live there well it can be viewed in dumfries we were kind of talking uh just before the q a started about uh so there's a community screening uh, happening in dumfries on the 22nd of july july at 7 p.m in a place called the stove network which is in the film. It's where Gordon has his MRI sound system kind of feasibility study where he's talking to the public about this idea. Mm -hmm. um, but it's already available on the BBC iPlayer. It's been on BBC Scotland already. Um, so the film is available on, on uh, the iPlayer if you would like to check it out or share it there. Um, we've got a website as well called uh, longlivemyhappyhead.com where you can, there's an iPlayer link there's a link to the iPlayer and there's a link to kind of all the screenings we have. All the yeah. screenings we have coming yeah. up. So. so if anyone has any relatives in America as well, they can watch it uh, next week at, uh, on the Frameline Film Festival on their doc, uh, virtual screening platform. Yeah, but it is also in person in San Francisco and we're going to be going out there uh, to do a QA, and a which will be really, really exciting. So if you know anyone in San Francisco also, you should spread the word. Thanks well, it's exciting question. you guys are getting to kind of spread the film all over the globe like that. Um, yeah. We have time for one more question from the audience, uh, from Kat. Uh, have there been any updates uh, since the film? Uh, I guess anything else about uh, what you guys are wanting to do with the film or anything that significantly has happened with the story? Um, yeah, I mean, we've obviously updated John Gordon's health. He went through brain surgery and radiotherapy. And I think Sean being here since October, uh, August last year has been just a major help for everyone. Um, uh, whatever updates would be interesting. Uh, <laughs> we've not done anything. We just work on this, <laughs> on this film basically all the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, there's not really been, Gordon and Sean are doing well. Sean was able to get a, an extension, like a, an extension on his visa on humanitarian grounds to be able to come and go. So that was a big relief of pressure on him. So he can now go back to the States and come back to Scotland without having to worry about being on the six month tourist visa. Um, so that that was quite a lot of work Like he had to he had an immigration lawyer and they had to apply for stuff and that got granted. So that's really good. I think that's taken a lot of pressure off of Sean. Yeah. Um, he's still he's he's spending most of his time here. He was here for like eight months basically the last time he was here. Mm -hmm. And then I think he will be here again for a while. Um, but he's, yeah, I think Gordon's 42 now. His friends all still love him. Yeah. Sean's still about. And uh, and we, we get to have a nice friendship now. Yeah. That's kind of the updates, which is good. It's not just me and him, but <laughs> me and uh, us and Gordon and Sean. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's fantastic to hear about uh, Sean is, um, You can listen to the soundtrack on Spotify. That's one oh, yeah. update. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fantastic. All right. I think that might be all the time we have. Uh, Austin, Will, thank you guys again so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Duncan. You're very welcome. And thank thanks, you, everyone, for, for watching the film. And your great questions. Yeah. Uh, and to those of you in our audience, if you haven't watched the film yet, uh, it's it's a really beautiful movie. You really, really should. Uh, it's in our virtual cinema until the 10th of July, and I, I cannot recommend checking it out enough. Um, to those of you in our virtual hub right now, the exhibitions will be open for another hour, so I recommend checking those out as well. There's some really cool, groundbreaking XR interactive stuff in there. Um, and otherwise, yeah, one last thank you for you guys for taking the time to join us. Cool. Cheers, Duncan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for staying up late. Yeah. yeah.